Everybody good? Nicole? Richard? I'd like to call to order this regular meeting of the Boulder Valley Board of Education for Tuesday, August 9th, 2022. Laura, would you please call the roll? Garcia? Here. Gebhardt? Here. Nesnik? Here. Rajpal? Here. Sargent? Here. Sweeney Moran? Here. Ziss? Here. Thank you. I'd like to remind everybody that the mission of the Boulder Valley School District is to create challenging, meaningful, and engaging learning opportunities so that all children thrive and are prepared for successful, civically engaged lives. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us electronically on BV22. We're glad to have you observe our meeting and participate in our meetings. At this time, I would take a motion to approve our agenda for this evening. Seconded by Beth. Laura, can you please call the vote on the motion to approve tonight's agenda? Garcia? Yes. Gebhardt? Yes. Nesnik? Yes. Rajpal? Yes. Sweeney, or Sergeant? Yes. Sweeney Moran? Yes. Ziss? Yes. Motion passes. We will begin tonight, as we always do, with the superintendent's report. Good evening, Dr. Anderson, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Board President Gephardt, members of the board. Good to see everyone. I hope everybody had a nice uh, month, month and a half of summer. Uh, hard to believe, but school is right around the corner. Uh, as the board knows and the public will know, uh, next week is the first week of school on August 17th. Uh, we have kindergarten through fifth grade, sixth and ninth graders that are starting school. Uh, for those who don't know, for those who might have elementary school students um, in middle and high school, we give our sixth and ninth graders a day to themselves at our schools to get acclimated, to make sure that they're transitioning, uh, they know where to eat lunch, all the things that, um, that kids and parents worry about. We, we try to really help them out and, and has proved to be a really great way to get kids off, um, especially in those transition grades, to a great start. Um, on August 18th, all other students will start and we start our first day of preschool on August 25th. Just a couple notices in regards to the first days of school. Um, for those parents who might need assistance setting up their parent portal accounts, completing their annual data update, submitting applications for free reduced lunches, enrolling at a school and they don't know where to come, they can come right here to the Ed Center, 6500 Arapaho, um, uh, and we'll be hosting that on August 11th, 12th, 13th, 15th and 16th from 9 to 4. I think the last day is 9 to 3. It's proved to be a, a great place uh, for folks to come and get the support they need so they can get their kids all signed up for school. You don't need to make an appointment. And so we would invite our community members who would want assistance in those areas to come and join us. Uh, just a reminder, as, as, we, as we get back to school and board members, um, at our next formal board meeting, we'll do our, our official back to school update, but just reminding our community to please drive carefully, uh, keep an eye out for all of our little ones who will be walking and, and, and riding their bikes to school. Uh, let's, let's all come together um, making sure that, uh, that we're keeping our community safe. Uh, this past week, I was able to welcome 135 new teachers through our new um, uh, teacher orientation, which was wonderful. Uh, we have a dozen new principals starting this year. Um, energy in, in, in the building has been just incredible. I um, really want to commend HR, who's been working day and night to make sure we get all of our candidates processed. I think we're down to maybe a handful of folks. Uh, you know, when we look uh, across the country to, to hear the just the, the tragic number of, of teaching vacancies that are, that are plaguing school systems across the country. We can just count ourselves as very lucky. Um, uh, we're almost, almost all the way fully staffed, and I think those that aren't um, vacancies where we're not staffed yet, we're in the process of, of hiring those folks. And so I'm really, really proud again of our team and all of our hiring managers and thankful for our HR team who's just been working overtime to make sure that, that, that we have all of our classrooms filled. And, um, and, and just very, very excited for the year. But it wouldn't be a start to the school year without a health services update. <laughs> Uh, you know, this is a tradition even, uh, and, and we're certainly in a much different situation than we were uh, over the past two summers and the past two Augusts and first board meetings. 
But you'll remember Stephanie Farron, our Director of, of Everything Health. And um, Stephanie, I'm going to turn it over to you to give us a very brief update on where things are, where we are as a community, and how we're proceeding and moving forward. Stephanie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Um, good evening, President uh, Gebkart, members of the board. It's really nice to be here in person and to actually see you all. Um, I would have been at home, but this is really much nicer. So thank you. Nice to have you all here. Um, so like Dr. Anderson said, we can't start school without a health services update. That's, uh, that's something that didn't happen before COVID, did it? Um, so we uh, do continue, as you all know, to have COVID in our community. Uh, CDC is continuing to utilize the community levels um, to differentiate uh, COVID risk levels in our community and to provide recommendations to individuals and local public health agencies. The guidance uh, around community levels really focuses on personal risk factors and mitigation. Um, is the, is the slides okay? Sorry, they're not. Sh there you go. Just want to make sure that you can see them. Sorry. Okay, that's fine. Um, so the uh, the mitigation uh, and recommendations from CDC really does focus on personal uh, level. Uh, mitigation and prevention activities as well as our local public health agencies um, and they are uh, designed around three different levels a low medium and high at this time Boulder County has moved into the medium uh, level of community uh, COVID unfortunately uh, pretty recently Broomfield did move back up into the uh, high level and those levels again really uh, they ask folks to take a lot of personal responsibility around what's safe for them, for their families, for their situations, whether that's masking um, and uh, different and vaccination and things like that. So we do know, unfortunately, that we will continue to have um, COVID and more illness uh, this fall as we come back to school and get back together in classrooms. Uh, that's something that we uh, know is going to happen. Now the good news is that BVSD has the second highest rate of COVID vaccinations in our students in the state. There is one small BOCES um, somewhere here in Colorado with 400 or so students that beats us, but uh, this is an incredible amount of uh, work and we really do owe it to our community uh, to thank them for coming together and making sure that our kids are able to come to school um, in person safe and, and healthy. So as you can see, we have 71% of uh, BVSD students are fully immunized and about 20% that are boosted. Um, and that might sound low, but that is um, quite a bit higher than other school districts around the state. Um, the current variants that are in our community we know are more transmissible. They do have some um, immunity and vaccine um, evasiveness, but the vaccine does still provide really good protection against severe disease and hospitalization. So that vaccination uh, level in our community is really going to do some uh, great protection for us. Um, and we, uh, you know, we know again that we'll have some illness, but we won't have folks that are super sick, thankfully. We are also working with our local public health agencies and CDPHE to provide uh, booster clinics this fall, and hopefully we'll have some uh, this month and then later on in the fall, um, hopefully being able to roll something out with flu vaccines as well, um, so that CDPHE will come and provide those in our communities for us. So we are returning to school with some COVID protocols, but they're quite different than what we've had over the last couple of years. Um, in the spring, CDPHE started to move to uh, treating COVID more as a routine communicable disease and using a communicable disease model that is more similar to what we saw in the past. So we're doing a lot of surveillance. We'll have a team of COVID nurses um, through some state uh, grant uh, through CDE that will continue to work with us um, on communicable disease surveillance and um, assisting our school nurses and schools. Um, so we'll be watching attendance data. 
Um, we will be obviously watching individual cases and if we see any sort of increase in illnesses in schools or in classrooms, communities, we'll work with local public health uh, to notify families about that. All of our schools uh, have access to masks and will continue to have them available for students and staff. And of course, we continue to support anyone who wants to mask. Um, and the thing about masks, right, is that even if it's not COVID, if it's a cold or flu or something else, masks work. So uh, we encourage folks, you know, to remember that we can all stay in school and we can have more folks in school. If they're ill, they wear a mask. Um, we will not be reporting individual cases, and the state is actually not going to be reporting uh, outbreaks any longer, again, moving to this more routine disease control uh, method. And then what would school be without a new emerging uh, communicable disease? So uh, just a moment about monkeypox, unfortunately. Um, we, um, you know, we will have, most likely have monkeypox uh, throughout one of our schools or in one of our schools at some point uh, this year. Um, the um, federal government did declare it a public health emergency just a couple of days ago. Uh, there are vaccines available. Um, they're in short supply, but they are rolling them out. We have a little over 90 cases right now in Colorado, uh, mostly um, contained to one uh, to, you know, certain groups of, of folks, although we know that monkeypox is transmissible to anyone, and it will likely start, as we do more testing, we'll begin to see it in more folks. So we have had, um, right now, only four cases in children in the country, um, which is, you know, wonderful news. However, there was an exposure at an Ill, at a daycare center in Illinois recently, uh, but they have not seen any cases resulting from that. So it is not transmissible like uh, COVID, um, much more similar to chicken pox. And, um, and I think that you know, we'll be fine if we end up seeing it. So that's all I have for you tonight. Are there any questions or anything? Sure. Kitty? Yes, I have a question about the masks that we're going to make available. Are they going to be N95 or KN95 masks? I believe we still have uh, the KN95 masks and surgical type masks that we got last year from yeah, the state. It was my understanding that the surgical type masks are not very good at preventing the new variant. So the new variants are incredibly transmissible and any mask is better than no mask. Um, and some folks are just more comfortable in a surgical type mask. So we know that uh, you know, there is risk, um, especially right now where our levels are relatively high, but we wanna make sure that whatever folks are comfortable in, we have available for them. Thank you. You're welcome. Lisa? Um, are we going to have the opportunity to send out to our families something about monkeypox in terms of what to look for and, and what symptoms are, et cetera? It feels like we're all sort of exhausted by the idea of having to deal with anything and maybe <laughs> putting know. this one off, and it might be useful for folks to know sort of what the warning signs are before they send a kid to school. So actually, uh, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Boulder County Public Health, I just saw tonight, is going to have a community forum on monkeypox, and so I will make sure to share that information with Randy, and he can put that out on our uh, community page if he hasn't already. I just saw that. I think it, it might be tomorrow, but it is going to be a community forum. And we are going to be sending out our COVID and kind of health-related protocols to all families in the spot this week. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Richard? No? Anyone? Nicole? Regarding our vaccination rates, are you hoping or expecting families to provide you with their booster doses when they get those, that, that additional information, or is that something that's not as critical <clears throat> for us to monitor? So the data that I'm referring to actually comes from CDPHE, from CIS, so that's without it being reported to us. We have alerted families that, you know, again, when their students move through school and into college, we can give them their vaccine record. It's one nice, easy place. So if they want us to include that, we will. But that data does come directly from the state immunization program. Yeah. So if um, 
when I should probably say someone comes down with COVID, I assume we're following the CDC guidelines, but maybe you could just refresh us really quickly Absolutely. as to what our expectations will be because yeah. I'm sure we'll be seeing that. Yeah. So the current expectations around a positive test are to stay home and isolate for five days. That's five days from symptom onset. Symptom onset is day zero, and then you count five days from that. And then you are allowed to return as long as you are fever free and your symptoms are improving without a, another test um, while wearing a well-fitted mask for an additional five days. We have heard that CDC is going to be updating their school guidance. Um, that is not out yet, and I believe CDPHE has been talking with our local public health agencies as well. Um, so there has been some talk around exposure, and instead of having to quarantine, um, instead wearing a mask for 10 days. So that has not come out officially, but we expect that that will be the new um, recommendation as well. So it's five days at home if you're positive, five days with a mask after that. And are there any reporting requirements for staff if they know that there's a case in the school or is not at all right? There is not. Um, it really is going back to um, where we were before in October 2019. Um, you know, we're expecting and um, really hoping that parents will follow the recommendations. We will continue to have those posted and they go out in um, kind of the bounce back email that folks get when they put an attendance report in through Infinite Campus. You get a, an email back that has that direction on it. So they can report it as COVID to the school or they can just report it as illness. Um, if it's reported as COVID, uh, we will keep an eye on that and you know see if there's other um, disease um, kids out in the class or grade or something like that, but it really is up to parents. Yeah. And if you monitor that, is there some limit at which you might think that we need to do something a little, another step to, mm -hmm. or, or not? Yeah, we have typically used an attendance rate of about 10 to 15% absenteeism to kind of trigger, hey, we think something might be kind of brewing. And that's, you know, f has been really that benchmark for years now. So what we've talked about with our local public health agencies is if we see, you know, 10 to 15 percent of absenteeism in a grade or in a school, um, we'll start asking and looking a little bit closer. Um, and then once we get to, you know, to maybe 20 percent or so, we will most likely send a letter similar to what we did at the end of school last year. Um, and alerting parents that we've had, you know, a case or two of maybe COVID and there's additional illness and we want them to be aware. Yeah. Well, thank you. It is really nice to see you in person. <laughs> and I hope we can continue to see you in person as, you. as we need to going forward. Right. Rob? And just one more update. Uh, I was reminded by our team that while the first day of school um, is a Wednesday, it is not a late start Wednesday, so it'll be at regular starting time for school um, for that first day of school on uh, Wednesday the 17th. And so uh, excited to be back out in our schools uh, next week and welcoming back our students and families and educators. And that is all I have for my update. So any questions for Rob from the board? All right. We'll now proceed to the next item on our agenda, which is public participation. Members of the public who wish to speak at tonight's meeting were asked to sign up prior to noon today by submitting the request to speak during public participation form that can be found on the BVSD website or by contacting the board secretary, Laura Schaefer. Public participants have the option to attend the meeting in person or join and present their comments via Google Meet. The board respects the rights of the public to speak on matters concerning the operation of the schools. We believe that public comments that are critical of district staff, however, often cause unnecessary harm to those employees and to the education of our students. As a result, we prefer that members of the public share any criticisms of employees in writing with the superintendent who is responsible for supervising all staff and then involving the board as necessary. 
If you choose instead to address a personnel issue publicly, please understand that the board does not endorse the comments of any speaker and reminds all who speak that they assume the risk of legal action by district employees in the event the affected employees believe that any comments about them violate legal standards. To ensure that our meeting is conducted in an orderly manner, we ask that persons who address the board confine your comments to matters that are germane to the business of the school district. Speakers on agenda items will be heard first, followed by those speaking to non-agenda items. Limit your presentation to two minutes. If we go over the first hour, which we will not tonight, public comment will continue at the end of the meeting. If you run out of time or would like to share additional information, you may email the board. Recognize that students often attend or view our meetings. Speakers' remarks, therefore, should be suitable for an audience that includes kindergarten through 12th grade students. The board president may interrupt, warn, or terminate a participant's statement that is unrelated to the business of the district or inappropriate for K-12 students. This video will be recorded for public viewing in perpetuity. BVSD reserves the right to remove you from the meeting if your video includes material that is inappropriate for the public or BVSD students. You will see a yellow card when you have 30 seconds remaining. When you have 10 seconds, you will see the orange card. Please wrap up your comments. At the end of your two minutes, a timer will sound and your microphone will be muted. Tonight, we will start with Mari Madeira. I don't see her. And she signed up for in person, right? Not for, mm -hmm. okay. Well, um, if she comes by the end of the public comment, we'll be happy to include her at the end. Um, our next speaker is Stacy Green. There we go. Um, and Ms. Schaefer, I believe that um, I have another member here who has gifted me her minutes so that I should be able to go up to four. Is that correct? Okay, wonderful. Just making sure. Good evening, members of the board. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Stacy Morris Green. I am a BVSD graduate myself and a parent of three BVSD students. And I'm here today representing Boulder Valley Gifted and Talented. As we move forward to this post-pandemic reality, uh, we want to reintroduce our organization, which has had a, a positive and collaborative relationship with BVSD for many years. Founded in 2007, Boulder Valley Gifted and Talented, or BVGT, is a nonprofit organization and an affiliate of the Colorado Association of Gifted and Talented. We strive to educate our community, serve as a source of support for families and for educators, and to advocate for the needs of gifted and talented students. In partnership with BVSD's GT department, we've sponsored two to four expert speakers each year regarding the needs of gifted kids. Gifted and talented, or GT, is an umbrella term, and that encapsulates a wide range of neurodiverse student experiences and intersectional identities. According to the 22-23 BVSD budget, 14.5% of BVSD students are identified as GT. So aside from students eligible for free and reduced lunch, that GT students comprise the largest of BVSD special populations. BVSD's GT students come from every demographic group. In addition, twice exceptional or 2E students are gifted as well as living with some type of learning disability, including dyslexia, ADHD, or autism um, spectrum disorders. The GT students possess unique academic, creative, and social emotional needs. Students may be formally identified as gifted in one or more areas, or as having an array of talents, including creative thinking, leadership ability, or artistic talent. But official identification of these students only begins to address our obligation to support them. Colorado law concurs, requiring what Colorado's Exceptional Children at Children's Education Act calls, quote, special provisions to meet their educational programming needs, end quote. Further, there are many common misperceptions about GT students. Some people assume that because they are, quote, smart <laughs> or highly capable in some areas, that they will do fine in school, or because their test scores may be high that they're making appropriate academic progress. But in reality, research and experience have shown us that GT students often can struggle in school academically 
and socially. Uh, they may underachieve or just fail to respond in ways that we might expect, a fact that is often discounted, disbelieved, and sometimes disparaged. BVSD is all in for all students. Each and every one of our students deserves to learn something new at school every day, and GT students are no exception. BVGT exists because students, parents, and school staff yearn for support. Our talented teachers face incredible opportunities and challenges in supporting GT students, and BVGT wants to continue to partner with our school district. Together, we must better engage these high potential learners. We look forward to continuing this conversation and we'll return to speak with the board this fall. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Mike Elson. Excuse me, wait, your mic's not on. Can you? There you go. Hello, oh, can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm here today to talk about transportation. Um, just recently learned that the bus route in my neighborhood was eliminated um, this school year, um, so it was a big disappointment. Um, you know, when we moved into our neighborhood, having the bus stop very close by was a big appeal, and we've enjoyed that bus service for many years now. Uh, not having bus service is a huge burden on parents. Um, it's um, a, distribution, a disruption to, uh, to work. You know, I can't tell my boss, hey, I, I've got to leave work every day at 2.45 and be gone for an hour. Um, the pickup lane at our school, at Monterey K Pre-K-8, takes about 45 minutes to pick up the kids from school. The, the, line, the cars are lined up around the block. It's a very slow process. Um, I know there's options for carpools and things. That is also just difficult to coordinate. Um, just one more burden that you have to put on busy families to work out how you're going to manage your week and who's going to pick up, who's going to drop off. Um, it's just a, a very challenging situation for parents. Um, we were deemed ineligible because we're a mile and a half away from school and we should, the kids should be able to walk in that scenario according to the district. Um, I think it's unsafe for the kids to be unattended on such a long walk. Um, it's a very long walk. It would take my students about 40 minutes to get to school um, walking. Uh, you know, in Colorado, we have cold weather, rainy weather, snowy weather, very cold temperatures. I think it's unreasonable for young children to have to um, walk such a long distance to school. Um, I've, through correspondence, I've learned that the issue is due to staffing. Uh, just like in any, every industry that we've seen recently that's had staffing issues, it's not a matter of lack of people to do the job, it's the compensation is not there to bring the people in to do it. So I feel like the district needs to step in and do what they need to do to get the staffing back to levels where we can have appropriate bus service in our neighborhood. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, I, I feel like it's just a detriment to um, the ability to have uh, you know, our normal service uh, that we expect for trans transportation to school. And uh, my hope is that the school, the district can continue to work to get staffing. My fear is that if we don't get a route this year, we'll never get a route back again. And we're gonna have years and years of having to deal with lack of transportation in our neighborhood. So I implore the board to work as best they can to, res you know, restore the bus services as they've been for years now and um, provide this essential service to the parents in our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I believe we have virtual with Shannon Young. Is that right, Laura? Um, yeah, Shannon Young Shannon, can you hear us? Shannon? I see her tile on the screen, but I don't hear her. 
Shannon, are you muted? It doesn't look like it. Do you want me to move on and we can come back and see if... Did you see that, Laura? She's asking, is there a call-in number? Um, Shannon, let me try to figure that out for you and text you something. In the meantime, we're going to move to the next person and we'll come back to you, okay? She did? <laughs> Thanks, Shannon, for being flexible. And um, we'll make sure we figure out something before we close public comments to get your comments one way or another. So next we have Michael Guidarelli. I'm going to butcher the name again, and I apologize, but come on up. Each of you should have a sheet like this that I'm going to refer to later. <clears throat> Members of the board, Superintendent Anderson, BVSD staff, and guests. My name is Michael Guidarelli. I'm a school bus driver for Boulder Valley School District for almost nine years. I'd like to provide you some perspective information regarding the transportation department, school bus drivers, the status of negotiations, and also offer you a challenge. School bus drivers and school student aides for BVSD will bid for routes by seniority tomorrow and Thursday. Four years ago, there were 269 drivers and aides bidding. As of last week, there are 196 drivers and aides bidding. There are a number of theories given to explain this decline, and most school districts have some degree of driver shortage. BVSD could reduce our deficit of drivers by being more competitive with other districts in our wages. For example, please look at your sheet on the far left column um, and uh, go down to the red circle number 12, and you will see the starting wage per hour for a rookie Boulder Valley driver for the last school year was $20.60 an hour. The starting wage for a rookie St. Vrain Valley bus driver for this school year is $23.47. <coughs> that is more than what a, a BVS driver would get starting their sixth year of driving as of last school year. They would get $23.30. Negotiations between the district and classified employees ended over two months ago, but are planned to resume September 19th and 20th when they meet with a mediator. In the meantime, I want to offer you a challenge. The transportation department is a family. We are very close. We help each other whenever we can. We have each other's back. We are emotionally connected. The perception of the transportation department towards the district is one of mistrust, that the district doesn't have our back nor looks at us with the same respect or regard as teachers or other staff members. In other words, the district and the transportation department are not emotionally connected. So here's my challenge to the members of the board, to Superintendent Anderson, and members of the district negotiating team, and other administration leaders. Take out your day timer or cell phone calendar. Set some time aside each week, every two weeks, or each month to visit one of our terminals in Lafayette, Boulder, or Netherland. Ride the morning run of one of our drivers and find out what the challenges are. Set a lunchtime visit and listen to the good, the bad, and the ugly of the driver's aides, mechanics, routers, dispatchers, Melissa, our payroll person, and administrators. Many of us have goals and challenges we are trying to work through with our students. By your attendance, you may have a better idea. You may have a suggestion to, for us to speak to someone else who could help. You may even have the solution. For example, I want to invite businessmen and women on my bus to Casey, who are bilingual, and speak to my middle, middle school students about the importance of growing their vocabularies in both English and their native tongue. 
and what the benefits are of that. By your visits to our campuses, we can learn much from each other and start to build our emotional connection with one of the end goals resulting in much shorter and much more amicable negotiation meetings. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Should we go to Shannon or should we go? We have one more speaker. Let's try Rodrigo first and then go to Shannon after that. Okay, so Rodrigo Lagos is virtual. Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? yes, we can. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, board members, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity of uh, being able to speak tonight. I'm here to also bring the topic of transportation, so I really appreciate all those others who have spoken already. Um, the, I have two kids, uh, the 10 uh, K8 Monarch, and uh, it's been very uh, not only disappointing that they have not been able to have bus service, but it's also uh, a question of safety, really. That's really where I want to begin. Um, not only is the drop-off area something that becomes so congested um, that it's uh, uh, impossible to get in and out, but also a safety hazard for our children. So as uh, uh, Superintendent Rob earlier said that we should watch out for our kids, yeah, I have to watch out every single time that I show up, not only for mine, but for everybody else. Not having a bus service there just increases how many people are there, congestion, frustration, etc., and makes that a uh, really dangerous place to be. Um, and in hearing what uh, the bus driver uh, Michael said earlier, um, he's really pointing to exactly what um, the board can do here to make a difference. Keep our safety safe, not only from walking, but walking through the middle of those cars to get to their classroom. It's really about doing the right thing and uh, being able to pay a fair wage to folks that are doing the hard work. So that challenge that um, that was posted, I'll reiterate, really step up to the challenge to not only be able to have uh, a way that is supporting our community and our community members, but to protect our kids and have them safe as they attend school. Um, those long walks, yes, in uh, the winter and in other challenging times for weather is also something that uh, concerns every parent. And even though we do our best as a community here to be able to create carpools and everything else, having two working parents full time being able to coordinate everything across all of our communities and friends is an impact here that is uh, becoming much, much, much difficult to be able to maintain. I appreciate your time and I implore you to please do the right thing for our kids. Thank you. Have we solved the problem with Shannon Young? Shannon, can you hear us? Not dialed in yet. Okay. Did Mari ever show up? I haven't Does seen he? anybody come okay. in. I, the board's pleasure would be all right to move into board comment, and when Shannon dials in, um, we can interrupt board comment. Um, I think that would be the right thing to do. So why don't we do that? I'm seeing nods of the head with moving forward with that. So uh, let's move on to board board member comment and see if we can get Shannon to dial in here. So board members, who wants to start? Don't all jump at once. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Nicole. I just wanted to say welcome back to school, or nearly back to school, everybody. I did our back to school shopping for my middle schoolers yesterday. I've been getting a lot of emails from school leadership, get, planning back to school nights, and so I think we're all getting ready mentally for, for all that's gonna happen next week. I want to say thank you to our speakers for um, attending virtually and in person. It's always great to hear from our community. And last but not least, give a shout out to the students and staff that participated in the National, National History Day um, and crushed it representing BVSD. So thanks to all of you for all your efforts. Laura, I'm just gonna keep looking at you till you tell me that we have to stop. <laughs> 
I know, thank you. Um, anyone else for board comments? Lisa, do you have? Then I'll go and then move to you, Lisa. How's that? Um, I want to give a shout out. I think those of us who are following Initiative 63 realize that we didn't get enough signatures to get it on the ballot. But those volunteers who um, stepped up to go out to farmers market and to various places around um, the city and the county and the state, I just want to give my heartfelt thanks because it's not easy going out and getting signatures. I personally thought it was one of the best um, and most creative ballot measures we've seen in a long time because it would have put a billion dollars into teacher salaries and staff salaries without a tax increase. Um, but it just shows kind of the, the pros and cons of direct democracy where if you don't have a lot of money and you can't pay for collecting signatures, it's really hard to do through a grassroots effort. So I just want to say thank you to those of you who were willing to step up and to try to get signatures and to not lose faith. We will continue the, the, um, the, the fight, I guess it is, or the battle towards trying to raise enough money to pay all of our staff um, a living wage and, and a more appropriate wage. So thank you to everyone for that. Um, I want to remind the board that coming up, I think it's at this next meeting, um, I'm looking to Laura, if we want to have any CASB resolutions for the delegate assembly, we need to have those come forward so that we can discuss any proposed resolutions that the board might want to have um, CASB bring forward. Um, and then I just want to say that we had a great meeting um, with the the chancellor and with the mayor and with one of the county commissioners, Claire Levy, and their staff. Um, we continue to have a great partnership. There's some really exciting work happening um, with, the, with our partnerships, and I look forward to continuing that, that good work. And we can talk a little bit more about what else is going to be on the ballot as a result of um, everybody facing um, challenges and being able to meet the constraints of constrained budgets. And so it'll be really interesting to see kind of I think everything is starting to take shape as to what's going to be on the ballot, and we can talk more about that later. But I just want to say thanks for that continued partnership, and I look forward to the continued work ahead. And I'm just rambling because I'm really hoping that Shannon is on. Is she on? OK. <laughs> I will stop rambling. <laughs> yeah, this is my two minutes. Hi, Shannon. You can go ahead. Okay, good evening. This is my first time addressing a school board meeting, and uh, that was just enough to almost make me too nervous to speak. But uh, I want to start by recognizing the exceptional work that I've seen at BBSC as a parent of three students there. And I also want to note that I'm speaking here tonight in a personal capacity and as a parent. I plan to speak about the free and reduced lunch eligibility. For many families, the transition from universal school lunches is going to be really tough, but it's going to be really especially hard for families already struggling to live in an area as expensive as Boulder. And that's especially true for the very low eligibility caps on meals benefits. Due to the high cost of living in Boulder, to income it's possible to both income qualify for Section 8 or other government subsidized housing while simultaneously making too much to be eligible for free and reduced meals. And for a family of five in Boulder, the cap for school meal benefits eligibility is just over $60,000 a year. And that's not even 50% of Boulder's area's median income for a family of five. My question to the school board is would it be possible, taking into account the very high cost of living in Boulder, to expand the eligibility criteria for free and reduced lunch to at least 60% of area median income? Children and families that qualify as low income for housing purposes should not be excluded from free and reduced lunch and the other benefits that come with it, like fee waivers and seats on the school bus and financial support for advanced placement tests. And qualifying for public housing should not be conflated for living in public housing. Many families sit on wait lists while spending the majority of their income on market rate rent here. My kids qualified for free and reduced lunch last year and we as we transitioned to living in Boulder. And I've done the math to know what a loss of eligibility means in terms of our house at expenses. As a daily entree, a serving of fruit, and a milk for lunch each day for two elementary school students and a high school student comes to over $360 a month. That's on top of a rent hike and inflation now at a 40-year high. 
I know my family is not the only one struggling to, to make the math work when it comes to being able to be in a position to send their kids to Boulder Valley School District schools and expanding the meals benefits criteria to 60% of the area median income would be a meaningful way to support those families struggling to live in the school district. Thank you. Thank you for your patience, Shannon, and, and hanging in there to talk to us. It was, it was important to hear from you, so thank you. All right, now I'll turn it over to Lisa. Shannon, thanks so much for calling yeah. in. Um, <laughs> I just want to underscore what Shannon was saying. It's, you know, it's tough for my family as well. We're not relishing going back without free and reduced lunches this year. It's incredibly expensive, and I know that um, we don't have this item on the agenda tonight, but we've also had some conversations around things happening at the state level and other things, and I appreciate what Shannon is saying in terms of is there some way that we can do something specific that recognizes that Boulder's cost of living it is impossible, especially with increased inflation. Is it possible for us to get a conversation around this, either send out an email form or to have it on the agenda in one of our next upcoming meetings to help our families across the district, many of whom I think are suffering with this? this new lack of free lunches, better understand what we might be able to do and what options are? Well, I have two things and I'll turn it over to Dr. Anderson. One is there will be on the ballot this year a measure that will um, provide for free and reduced lunch. I need to look it up. I don't know if it's just K-5 or if it's K-12. I'm looking at Kathleen I, and we need to look that up. I'm also looking for my lifeline with Mr. Sutter, but he's not making eye contact with me, um, <laughs> which means I think we have to look the answer up. The other thing is that um, because this is, I think we've recognized that the free and reduced lunch measure um, is an important one. And so there's um, a bill was passed last year to reevaluate how we actually calculate free and reduced lunch. And so looking at multiple measures and pulling different data from different data sources, I don't remember the timing of that, but I'm happy to report on that back as well. So I think this is a current issue in front of the voters and in front of the legislature going forward um, because I think people have realized after having two years of having had free lunch that it really is a great benefit to our, um, to our families. And so trying to figure out what we do um, because I think it is kind of a cliff. I mean, you either qualify or you don't is my understanding at some point. Um, what, what does that look like and what can we do? So I do think that there, we will be looking at answers. I don't think that helps Shannon in the short term, but I certainly hope that um, we can start addressing those issues as we go forward. Um, Rob, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Certainly. I do think this is an important issue. I know that we've been advocating at the federal level um, through, through the organizations that we're connected with around this. Um, I think for board members who are interested in having further discussion on this, this would be a great item for our prioritization list as we think about um, having this conversation, having our, our retreat slash kind of annual workshop to prioritize items. And I also think an RFI to um, maybe dig into um, are there other districts that are subsidizing free and reduced lunch meals beyond the federal um, the federal guidelines. I think both would be would give the staff the, the direction we would need to kind of dig into this. Did that help answer your questions, Lisa? I'll work on that RSI now. <laughs> All right. Any other um, board communications? So this concludes public participation. We appreciate hearing from our public. And we will move on to information items, of which there are none. <laughs> so now we will move on to the consent agenda action items. So is everybody still doing OK? We haven't been going an hour, but I just wanted to check. OK. OK. So action items, consent grouping. 6.1, personnel items. 6.2, approval of minutes, June 21st, 2022, special meeting. 6.3, approval of minutes, July 27, 2022, special meeting. 6.4, approval of minutes, August 2nd, 2022, special meeting. 6.5, correction to resolution number. 6.6, .6, Dreambox math agreement renewal. 6.7, lifelong learning enrichment program, consulting professional service agreement for kids to pros. 6.8 MOU Mental Health Partners for Halcyon Services, 6.9 Petroleum Purchase and Delivery, 6.10 Grant Transportation Clean School Bus Rebate Program, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency 22. 
Does any board member wish to pull anything from the consent agenda grouping? Hearing none, I need a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved by Stacy, seconded by Kitty. Is there any discussion on any of the consent agenda items? I have a quick question for Rob Price. On the bus, the electric bus, could you just fill us in on, I think there's two sources of grants. Isn't there a federal grant and a state grant? Just really quickly, like the 50,000. Yeah, it's you exciting. are correct. This is the federal grant. This is the EPA grant. We had an opportunity to apply for electric buses or propane buses. We made the decision to apply for propane <clears throat> based on the number of things. One, the range of an electric bus. Right now, the electric bus only goes about 100 miles, so that only serves a very limited number of our trips. Uh, two, the weather has a significant impact on the electric buses, so we're waiting for technology to improve. Um, three is the infrastructure, and that's where we are behind right now, and that's probably the most important part of this. So we are exploring some options of doing a joint uh, facility with a number of different entities and uh, Boulder itself on how we can do this more affordable. So that's the, those are the biggest challenges we're faced with now. The other thing is, is propane buses are uh, less costly. I think they're about 110,000 versus, I think 125, 135,000 after the grant rebate. So uh, taking all those factors into account, we decided to go after uh, propane buses this go around, knowing there's another round. So if we can figure out the infrastructure piece, we'll continue to pursue electric just to uh, lessen our carbon footprint within the district. And when you say we are lacking the infrastructure, you mean we as a state, not just we as a district? Good comment. Yes, you are correct. Yep. And how many propane buses do we currently have? Do you know, roughly? I would, I believe 30 to 40 propane buses, and we'll have, when this next round of buses come in, we'll have nine electric buses. We currently have one. We're waiting on the other eight to come in. Um, and then we'll be ordering some additional propane buses. So we, just as a reminder, we run uh, diesel buses up in the mountain. Both electric and propane won't serve our needs up there. So we'll continue to run diesel up there, um, electric and propane down here as we're renewing our fleet. Thanks. Yep. Laura, should we, any other questions about the consent agenda before we call the roll? All right, Laura, could you call the roll, please? Garcia. Yes. Gephardt. Yes. Nesnik. Yes. Rajpal. Yes. Sergeant. Yes. Sweeney Moran. Yes. Ziss. Yes. Motion passes. Next up is our action item. Since we have nothing pulled from the consent grouping, it's 7.2, our facilities critical needs plan. Rob, do you want to do the introduction of Rob Price? I would be thrilled to do the introduction. Uh, board members, we have a lot to be proud of this evening as we present to you this item for action. Um, our team has been hard at work uh, over the past year, really assessing our needs, our critical needs from a facility standpoint. Our academics team has been hard at work really thinking about the opportunities that we provide for students today and what that should look like in the future. And as Rob gets ready to present our final list of critical needs and the final bond, proposed bond language, I'm here to tell you and our community, number one, um, these needs are critical needs, that by investing in our schools that we will be able to make sure that we take care of our 4.6 million square feet um, of facilities that we operate, uh, and we'll be able to do that in a proactive way. Did I get that right, Rob, 4.6? 4.8. See, I just kept it a little <laughs> short so you could chime in just to emphasize. I don't want to correct part. you, no, but yes. No, you can always correct me. Uh, 4.8 million uh, square feet. Uh, we know um, that we have overcrowding um, issues that are on the horizon that if we don't address today, it'll be too late and our options will not be good if we let that um, get away from us. Uh, we know and understand the importance 
of career and technical education as a key component to our Grad Plus initiative, a key and important aspect of building the workforce here in Boulder County, um, and helping kids reach their goals and soar, as we've stated in our All Together for All Students strategic plan. Um, and then things like, uh, and Rob, I'm, I'm not stealing your thunder, but I might be a little bit, uh, the idea of, of making all of our playgrounds ADA accessible. So our students with disabilities can, can play side by side with their peers. Ridding our schools of as, uh, asbestos, right? I mean, as, as Rob goes through what's in this list, what we've added, what we've included, uh, board members, I, I think that you'll see the hard work that we've put in and the promise for our kids and our community if we move forward uh, with this bond measure. So with that, I'll turn it over to our uh, incredible assistant superintendent of operations, Rob Price. Dr. Anderson, thank you. Good evening, President Gephardt, members of the board. Uh, I do stand here with great pride tonight. So tonight before you is our final uh, critical needs plan. Uh, the plan right now describes $350 million in capital improvements identified by staff over the last year and reviewed by our capital improvement plan review committee. So this plan will serve as the guiding document for a bond program should the board approve the ballot question that is on tonight's agenda. So just to start before we dive right in to provide a little bit of context. So why do we continue to turn to our taxpayers for help? And really the question comes down to is the state doesn't provide enough funding to educate our students and to maintain our facilities. So we continue and we've been on about an eight year cycle of asking our taxpayers to pitch in for bond measures, et cetera. So just want to uh, highlight that. It's not only Boulder Valley School District, it is every school district in the state of Colorado that is faced uh, with these same decisions. Where students learn matters. We have a responsibility to provide students and staff with learning environments that are safe, functional, and comfortable, and to maintain the taxpayer uh, funded facilities that create those environments. So at this time, we've identified $350 million in critical facility needs that need to be addressed in the next four years. This work falls into four main categories. The first being maintaining our aging buildings. Second, building additional capacity for enrollment growth in Erie. Expanding our career and technical education options to better prepare our graduates for post-secondary success and improving ADA access on our playgrounds. So the first major category that we'll be investing in is uh, maintaining our aging of buildings, our aging buildings. So as a reminder, we own 61 facilities uh, that total over 4.8 million square feet. These buildings range from one year old, that's Halcyon, to 140, year old, 140 years old, and that's Whittier Elementary School with more than half being over 40 years old. Most of our buildings still have decades of life in them. That's because of the investments we continue to make in our buildings, but our systems and our equipment like roofs and boilers wear out, need to be replaced. As a reminder, in 2021, we worked with a third party vendor, which was Gordian, to visit and assess 4.8 million square feet of facility space and over 800 acres on our sites. So the team evaluated major architectural, mechanical, electrical, and site infrastructure system components, estimating their in-kind replacement values. The assessment identified over $670 million of needs over a 10-year period. So more than half of the critical needs plan would be directed to major maintenance, such as roofing, pavement, updating life safety systems that are needed within the two years to keep our, safe, our facility safe, operational, co-compliant. Since different building systems wear out at different rates, right, we have some components that need to be replaced at different times. So when we go in, when we think about the 2014 bond, we replace portions of the roofs on certain schools and we didn't replace others because the others were not at their end of the, their life cycle. And I think that's an important note. Mechanical systems, when we say we go in and we upgrade our mechanical systems, we don't upgrade every single component. We re go upgrade those components that need to be replaced at the time the bond was passed and the assessment was completed, if that makes sense. 
So included in this critical needs package is highlighted here are priorities one and two. Those are items that need to be done in the first two years and cannot be deferred without impacts at some point or additional risks that we're going to impact the learning environment. I think that's key. That is what keeps me up at night is what happened at Monarch High School last year. At one point, we had to vacate the school because the boiler went out and we had a glycol leak, if everyone remembers As that. a parent, at two points. You're right. And both times were glycol leaks. And both times, that was aging equipment because of an aging boiler. That's what we're trying to avoid. So delaying this critical work will allow conditions deteriorate while costs escalate. As equipment and systems age, the risk of ma uh, major failures would significantly disrupt a school day. That also increases. So addressing these needs now will re reduce costly emergency repairs in the future and will avoid disruptive uh, impacts to the learning environment. Again, here's just some examples. We've you've seen these before. Uh, we've got building envelope issues. There's a lot of our buildings with masonry need to be tuck pointed, uh, resealed, um, recocked. Uh, we have a significant amount of site paving issues, synthetic turf fields that need to be replaced, ADA issues that need to be resolved within our sites. And then the last two pictures of significant uh, mechanical uh, equipment that needs to be replaced, electrical equipment, life safety systems, et cetera. You'll see that throughout the critical needs list. Another priority uh, and included in the critical needs plan is the replacement of New Vista High School. So the building right now has aged to the point where the cost to repair and renovate is significant enough. It really makes more fiscal sense to replace the building than rather than continue to invest in it. So a building assessment was conducted in 2019 showed that the cost to repair and renovate the building to address all the identified deficiencies was more than 75% of the cost of a new building. In January of 21, the board supported the recommendation of the new Vista working group to build a new building on the same site. The design of that has begun, and if approved, if the bond is approved, we would begin construction in 2023. And I know uh, board member Sweeney Moran, you asked me for a completion date. I'm not gonna provide that tonight. It's gonna be dependent on us getting a contractor on board, seeing what the market is. But we are committed to starting that project in 23 and then uh, reporting soon thereafter after we have people on board. I do think it's important to talk about the advantages of a new building. A new building we construct to last at least 70 years. Uh, maintenance costs are significantly reduced with the new building. Increased in, uh, energy efficiency compared to the existing building uh, would be significantly increased. And then I think the most important thing is, is think about the learning environment and what they're learning in today. The learning environment will suit the needs of the students today, not what that was in 1950 or 52. So real quick, uh, we're going to let you hear, we're going to show a video uh, and let you hear from Alex Robertson, was, who's a New Vista teacher now. Alex also attended New Vista when he was a student. And then uh, Eric Ironside, who is a community member in the New Vista working group. You know, you know what they say about a square peg in a round hole? Um, we're trying to uh, create a pretty incredible um, non-traditional educational program in a pretty traditional building. Lots of separate classrooms, long, dark hallways, a building that was built in the 1950s when education looked very different from what it does here at New Vista. And the heating system is 70 years old and requires constant tinkering. The single pane windows are not helping. Leaks in the roof are problematic. Um, frequently, during a, during a rainstorm, we'll see buckets just posted all over the building collecting water. We considered a whole bunch of options. I mean, we, we considered rebuilding the school. We considered fixing up what we had and everything in between. There's just so much wrong with this old building and that there's so much needs as far as, you know, the remediation and just the, the way that the foundation is subsiding and all of that kind of stuff, um, that the best thing to do for the students and financially was to build a new building. I mean, there just was no way that you could renovate this building and have it make sense going out, you know, 5, 10, 15 years. I mean, just, it, was, it was a waste of money to try to fix what we have here and have it make any sort of sense on a return on investment. 
In addition to these major maintenance projects, there are also projects to expand access to our playgrounds and continue to remove the amount of hazardous materials when we, that we have in our building. So as you can see from this photo, the intent is, is to remove the engineered wood fiber, the wood chips at some of our schools and replace it with a rubberized surface where children of all abilities can play. Although we are talking about facilities tonight and we continue to talk about facilities, let's remember the reason we continue uh, to invest in our aging buildings. So as a reminder, our staff and students will benefit from and never more important than the last two years was our improved indoor air quality. Uh, I think the investments we made through the 2014 bond set us up to bring in enough fresh air to combat the COVID virus as we were learning in our classrooms. The reduced risk of disruption in the school day from equipment failures, increased safety. I wanna talk about this a second. We made significant improvements and made a great headway in the 2014 bond when we put in our secure, secure vestibules. We uh, put in intrusion detection systems. We compartmentalized our buildings. In this bond, we're talking about life safety systems, fire alarm systems, fire suppression systems, making sure that our intercom systems, our uh, public address systems are upgraded. Never more important than during emergency that you depend on those types of systems. So we'll be investing a significant amount, making sure that those systems are updated. And then I think Dan Ryan says it best. It sends a message and the message is that our students matter and our students deserve this. The second major category where we'll be investing our money is in our enrollment. So new school, as you know, is needed within the next four to five years to address enrollment growth in Erie. Right now, we are at capacity at PK-5 at the Metal Arc School, and we're projected to be at 50% over capacity, so at 150% within the next five years. So we also, and that's just from Metal Arc's attendance area, and then we've got a 1,400 home uh, single family development that's coming in known as Parkdale. It's between Arapo and Baseline. Uh, homes will go up for sale in October. That will generate enough students uh, for the need for a new school. So um, right now we are going to hear from Principal Caldwell, who is the Metal Arc School Principal regarding the growth in Metal Arc's attendance area. Oh, we continue to just have um, extensive growth. Literally every week we get new families um, because of the new homes and it's one of the more affordable areas in Boulder County and beautiful homes. So uh, it's very enticing for people to come here. We don't want to wait until all schools are overcrowded and learning is impacted. I think that's the key here. So we've got, we can always come back to this with a large number of portables, but uh, it's not the conducive learning environment that we've all strived for. So uh, it is clear, very, very clear that permanent capacity is needed in the area long term. The third major category we'll be investing in is career and technical education. So earlier this year, community leaders gathered, discussed how to improve Colorado's K-12 education system. Our community expects public education to provide opportunities that allow every child to succeed. Employers want education to align with our workforce needs. We've recognized, Dr. Anderson and staff have recognized that we must continue to do more to meet this challenge. I love this photo because none of our spaces in our buildings look like this. Um, you know, when I think about some of our buildings that were built in uh, 1882, like Whittier or Boulder High, built in the 1930s, um, education's changed, but the, the educational environment has not changed. I'm not sure we should all be proud of that. But we do know that the future of work will continue to evolve. And according to a report authored by the Institute for the Future, 85% of the jobs that exist in 2030 haven't even been thought of today. I think that's an amazing step. So in a rapidly changing world, our students need learning environments that go beyond the traditional classroom environment. And that's something that we have not provided. So we really recently introduced the Grad Plus framework, which will provide the extra credentials that graduates need for the changing dynamics of the world in post-secondary education and work. Grad Plus will provide that connection between traditional academics 
and career and technical education, helping students make the most of high school and gain direct connections to careers that will serve them well throughout their lives. Currently, we are not meeting the needs of our students, the community, and the workforce because of inadequate CTE opportunities. Each year, we have more students interested in these courses than we are able to serve, and that's due to a lack of space and a lack of programming. So to expand these opportunities so more students can experience CTE, the critical needs plan includes renovations at K-8s, middle schools and high schools, as well as the Boulder Technical Education Center to create learning environments that let students get hands-on experience in state-of-the-art spaces by creating industry mimicking spaces for careers that are high demand and high growth. BVSD will be poised to build intentional pathways in areas such as cybersecurity, biomedical science, creative media production, computer science, engineering, healthcare, culinary arts, and more. So the next step will be to ensure these new learning environments meet the needs of our students and our community. So we will engage in a collaborative process that includes local employers, school leaders and faculty, students and parents and community members. The process will be informed by existing and future input from community or from students and families regarding career pathways, discussions with local industry partners about collaborative programming, and ideas from district leaders, principals, and faculty about the feasibility and the appropriateness for where to locate various programs. There will be opportunities for communities to participate in the conversation as well. From this collaborative process, we will determine what programs need to be offered and where it makes the most sense for them to be located. Some pathway programs can feasibly be implemented at some or all of our high schools, while other programs need to be located at Boulder Tech just due to their large space requirements, intensive equipment, et cetera. So when projects move into the design phase, school design advisory teams will work with the architects to guide what the renovations will look like at each school. So all of the capital improvements that we've discussed tonight will protect taxpayer investments and make a significant positive impact to the learning environments of our students today and far into the future. We continue to believe in the value of listening to community voices uh, to guide our work this spring. As you know, we had a 23 member capital improvement plan review committee composed of teachers, parents and community members. They met with staff to review our identified needs and provide their uh, perspectives and feedback. Extremely valuable as you're looking at this plan tonight. Um, if we are able to move forward, a stakeholder committee will provide oversight of the program. That's our Citizens Bond Oversight Committee. Uh, <clears throat> and then we will move into our design advisory teams that work with the architects, work with the school community to make sure we're meeting the intent of the master plan. So here is a, uh, the final detailed list of the critical needs. I'm gonna walk through these. So $160 million will go to facility improvements and completing priorities items one and two. So that's major maintenance and facility improvements. 36 million plus the proceeds from the 2014 bond will go to construct a new school for New Vista on the same site. 8.4 million will go to removing hazardous materials in our buildings. $40.9 million will go to constructing a new school to address enrollment growth in Erie. $22 million will be to expand CTE opportunities at our secondary schools, that's K-8s, middles, and high schools. $21.4 million will go to renovate Boulder Tech Center. $845,000 will be to construct a culinary teaching center for career and technical education. $6.8 million to improve ADA accessibility on some of our playgrounds, not all. $44.5 million for inflation, and then $8.5 million will be reserved for the entire program. That totals to $350 million. Another way to look how the money will be spent, 54% will go to major maintenance and facility improvements. Almost 14% will go towards constructing a new school in Erie, 12% to New Vista, 15% expanding career and technical education, 
and 5% to address ADA accessibility on our playgrounds and uh, removing asbestos materials. I do want to point out the $350 million tax increase would be approximately $983 a month for a home valued at $600,000. If your home is valued at $1.2 million, your uh, increase would be approximately $20 a month. For a business, it is $80 per month for a business for each million dollars of non-residential property value. Just want to leave you with a couple closing thoughts. The critical needs plan we are bringing, you, bringing to you tonight is both responsible and aspirational. Major maintenance and facility improvements allow us to continue to provide safe, comfortable learning environments. We will reduce the presence of hazardous materials in our buildings, make it easier for all of our kids to play and exercise on our playgrounds. This work is also intended to extend the useful life of our buildings. The proposed renovations in career and technical education aspire to build a stronger bridge between education and the worlds of work and college so that our graduates are fully prepared when they leave Boulder Valley School District. At this time, I just want to say that wraps up the presentation. I want to just extend a special thanks to our Capital Improvement Plan Review Committee for the time they put into this, our new VISTA Working Group Committee uh, that put uh, several hours, um, even months, into the decision on what to do out there. I want to thank our entire maintenance department. They put in a lot of time with the facility assessments, uh, organizing, prioritizing needs, our instructional leadership to work through the CTE needs. Uh, that are defined in this plan. Um, Susan Cousins has been amazing as we've been putting this report together and thank you Dr. Anderson for your leadership and commitment to this work. And with that, President Gebhardt, I will turn it back over to you. Thanks Rob, that's super exciting. Um, anyway, let's start with any board questions. Stacy. Yes, thank you that um, so much work has gone into this and it's really exciting to see it come to this presentation. Um, where will the culinary center be located? The culinary center will be located in the central kitchen. So we've okay. shelled out the space when we constructed it a few years ago. So this would build out that space and then Boulder Tech students would be able to utilize it. Great, um, thank you. Yep. Just a couple comments. Um, as long as I've been on the board, we've been talking about New Vista. So I'm excited that it's gonna happen. And I also just wanna say, this isn't just some random high school that is old. This is a program that um, I've had many families over the years tell me that if not for New Vista, their child would not have graduated from high school. Like this is a really important program that we offer. So I'm really excited to see this happen. Um, also excited about the playground upgrades. Again, ever since I've been involved in the district, we've always been talking about the playground. So that's, the, that's good too. And then just lastly, I've been around long enough to know what it was like before Meadowlark was built. And we don't want to get back to that spot. Um, the schools in Lafayette were so overcrowded and we just don't want to go. We don't, we can't go back to that. That would be very difficult. So thank you again. Thank you. Lisa. Um, yeah, I don't think I have any questions. I think I've asked them all over the course of the time we've been doing this, but I did just want to echo Stacy. I think you summarized perfectly all the reasons why this bond is important and add, um, any of you who've watched these meetings have probably heard Kathy and I joke about the fact that the building New Vista is currently in was old when she and I each went to school in it. So I think the degree of oldness is, is almost difficult to understand if you haven't walked through it. Um, and similar to what Stacy said, you know, New Vista came about when I was in high school in Boulder High. Uh, I had lots of friends who went there in the first few years and it certainly made a difference. We have kids who would have ended up with GEDs or without anything at all absent New Vista. So it's a remarkable program and I'm so excited we can support it. Richard. <clears throat> Thank you, Rob. Great presentation. And uh, I did all, everything that both Lisa and Stacy have said. I just want to let you know that my daughter graduated from New Vista uh, when it was at PADAC. Uh, so you can see that New Vista has been kind of bumping around a little bit, you know. New Vista started at the primary school in at uh, University Hill. It was a, a preschool and they had to renovate that so that they could fit in some high schoolers in there and went to Paddock and then Baseline and boy, it's about time. 
and I appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Kitty? Yes, thanks, Rob. I echo what has been said. I'm excited about this bond and what we're going to be able to do for our, our kids. Um, we've mentioned a couple of times at meetings that Colorado does not provide funding for building. Do other states provide funding for building? Do most of them, some of them, do you know? You know, yes, I do know that other states <laughs> do that. Uh, the state to the north of us actually provides funding from the state to fund the construction and renovation of their buildings. Now, how many states actually do that? I don't know the, the exact number, but I do know other states do that. Okay. Yep. And my next question is, how much new VISTA money do we have left over from the 2014 bond? It's uh, approximately $10 million. Okay. So total construction of around $46 million for new VISTA. Thank you. Yep. Beth or Nicole, go ahead, Nicole. I just want to say thank you to our district staff for working hard to provide a bunch of detailed, additional detailed information on how we intend to use these bond funds. Many of you know I've been struggling um, with my feelings around this bond, but the details you were able to provide have really moved my thinking and I think will help move the thinking of the um, members of our community. Uh, I, and my concerns were really around um, the number of potential ballot me measures that might increase taxes for folks, the current economic conditions, and uh, concerns around declining enrollment. But I really agree that we need to address some of these critical needs in our facilities and the growth in Erie. And I'm really excited to hear that we are building flexible spaces that not only um, will address the current needs, but needs that are in the, might occur in the future, and that we're using a body of evidence and a body of imp a bunch of input to, to get there. Um, by providing these opportunities and these spaces for our students, we're not only improve their outcomes, but really, really improve um, the outcomes for our community as itself. I still struggle um, and wrestle with the idea of building a new school in an area of declining enrollment, but that won't let me get in the way of this of approving this bond, and I really hope it doesn't for our community members as well. Beth. <clears throat> Similar to Lisa, I don't have any questions. I really appreciate all the, the work and the information you provided. I did want to um, make a couple comments um, as we move forward here. I, too, am very excited about this bond. Um, I'm thrilled to imagine how our facilities will support our CTE programs. And the uh, special educator in me is really happy to hear about the ongoing discussion of ADA accessibility for students with disabilities. Um, you know, I really believe in the work of the staff we have in place. Um, but maybe more, even more importantly than that, I, you touched on it in your presentation too, I think we have the community voice involved to get this right. Um, so I hope that we'll continue to, that the community will continue to engage with us. Um, I just really appreciate all the work the team has done. And for me, the, the kind of the philosophical part of me is excited about the bond because I think a good public education, like the one we enjoy here in BVSD, is something that can't be taken, shouldn't be taken for granted. And part of not taking that for granted is engaging in an act of uh, stewardship, caretaking, and taking care of our facilities is certainly that, planning and supporting our students of today and of the future. So I'm really excited about this bond and I just wanna thank everyone again for all the hard work. I just had a few extra comments. Thank you um, from everybody for all the hard work. I know we've all had to wrestle with our own questions and concerns as we've brought this forward. It's been on a kind of a short timeline. And so thank you to Rob and your staff and Dr. Anderson for um, bringing this forward quickly because as you've said, I think the, the timing is right. What I've heard you talk about, Rob, a couple times is that, can you just talk about why the timing makes sense when we look at other neighboring districts and, and how you think that puts us at least at a slight advantage if we are able to pass this and our ability to go forward? I think that's extremely important to note. <clears throat> We, right now, I know maybe two, possibly three other school districts that will be going. We have one uh, up north, Windsor School District, Douglas County is considering a bond measure. And then Denver School, Denver Public Schools, my understanding is on the fence about going for a bond measure. I think it's extremely important. Some years you'll see a half dozen, a dozen school districts going at the same time. And we compete with the same general contractors that complete our work. Uh, same subcontractors that build our, our schools. 
So if when looking at the competition, now is the time to go when we're not competing against several other school districts that are coming out of the gate at the same time. Douglas County is far enough away, we won't see a lot of uh, competition, but it's really from the Denver metro area north all the way up to Fort Collins where we see that competition. So the costs aren't gonna get any cheaper. I mean, we've got to, we're dealing with inflation right now. What we're not dealing with is the competition from other districts if we go in November. And that will help drive our costs down. And then as other districts start going, we'll have to compete with them. But now is the right time to go just from a cost standpoint of not competing with general contractors and subcontractors for other school district work. I think that the board and those people who are listening understand that one of our biggest challenges in Colorado is paying an adequate wage. And so the, some questions I anticipate that we'll get is, well, can we use this money to help? Why aren't we going for teacher salary increases and why are we doing this now? Can you or Dr. Anderson or, or um, someone kind of explain the different pots of money and how, why we have to do this this way? And we recognize that the teacher salaries and staff we, um, wages are not where we'd like them to be, but this is the the road we have to go for this. I just think it, as we have to answer those questions to our public, I think it's really important for them to understand the, the different paths. Rob? A absolutely, and uh, I'll ask Bill Sutter to mosey on up to the mic in case uh, we want um, a, a true expert opinion on the finances in the state of Colorado. Uh, you know, board members, we're really proud about um, uh, you know, the, the wages that we pay our employees. Uh, you know, we continue to pay um, well above market value with our teachers. We have the highest average teacher salary in the entire state of Colorado. Um, and we use uh, general funds to be able to do that. Now, theoretically, you could take money out of operational costs and try to do some of these things, but it's not feasible. We'd have no employees. We'd have no one to work in the facilities we were building because we wouldn't be able to pay them appropriately. Um, and so as we think about this bond measure, this is the expectation expectation of the legislature on how do we keep up and maintain our facilities, especially districts that are big. And we're a big district. We're 30,000 students, 4.8 million square feet, 59 facilities. 61 facilities. I'm, I, you know, Rob and I have a thing going. I say he goes, I go low, he goes high. Um, so, so this is the this is the way um, that that. In Colorado, you maintain your facilities and you and you um, provide the right learning spaces uh, for the things you're trying to do for students. And so, um, there are other opportunities that other districts could go for in regards to other like mill levy overrides and things of that nature. I don't know if you want me to get into that, Kathy, uh, but this bond measure is for the facilities. These are one-time expenditures. These are we're not spending this money for ongoing expenditures. We're going to get our we're going to take care of our facilities. Now, I will say that when you upkeep your facilities, it drives down operational costs which we can take those dollars back and, and drive those dollars to salaries and to the critical needs so we can support our students and our employees. Bill, do you have anything to add? You, you did say one thing, Rob, that maybe Bill can elaborate on, which is we could take general fund dollars and put them into facilities, but then we'd have less money to pay our staff. But we can't take the bond money and put it into staff. So you can, so if you could just talk about that for a second. So the, these dollars are dedicated dollars, and they're not dollars that we can spend on staff. Uh, correct. The, the, it's a, a one-way street, so to speak, of uh, being able to use um, uh, operating funds uh, to build something uh, or, or make a major capital investment uh, versus uh, these bond funds, which are very specific, uh, regulated by federal uh, and state rules uh, and laws. Um, the I, it might be lost on some people that we actually do spend millions of dollars per year on maintenance of our buildings. It's not that uh, the, the term maintenance kind of gets uh, put out there sometimes that, that uh, these dollars are being used for uh, maintenance of our buildings, these bond dollars. Uh, but these are major capital investments. These are not uh, run down to Home Depot for a little spackle and paint and fix things up. These are, you know, multi-hundred thousand dollar, million dollar 
uh, investments in things, roofs, boilers, parking lots, uh, things like that. So um, it's not, if you were to take those operational dollars and spend them on these uh, very expensive, very large projects, uh, you would be dipping into a significant portion of operating dollars to be able to fix them uh, on an ongoing basis. That was my next question, was we do spend general fund dollars for, for general maintenance, but not for these bigger ticket items. So I, I don't want people to think we aren't trying to take care of our facilities within our existing budget, but for the bigger ticket items, we need to go for a bond. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. And, and can you, in like two minutes or less, explain the operational and technology mill? Because some pe that has come up a couple times for questions and just um, how we're using those dollars and why we still need to do the bond. Sure. The uh, operations and technology mill levy uh, that was passed in 2016 uh, was an opportunity to uh, shift some expenses out of the general fund, uh, existing expenses out of the general fund and onto uh, this new revenue stream that was authorized by the legislature. Um, it was very clear and transparent at the time uh, that we did that, both in the polling and reporting on the polling uh, and the information that was shared, uh, that those freed up resources in the general fund were going to support things like programs and staff compensation uh, and materials. Um, the, we are spending those dollars on technology, on maintenance, on operational costs. Uh, it was just existing uh, dollars uh, that that were in the general fund, and it was a way to generate more resources for the district at the time. Uh, it is an option to go ask uh, the voters for additional resources in that uh, particular mill levy, um, but when you're talking about uh, uh, $40 million to build a building, uh, the, the way, the mechanism of a, a general obligation bond that spreads those costs over 30 years, uh, you do pay more because of interest uh, as, as uh, any mortgage uh, for any homeowner would look like. Um, you know, if you were gonna do that all at once to go generate $40 million uh, in a mill levy, you would have to spike uh, property taxes for a very short period of time a couple of years while you were doing it, and it would make a, um, a property tax bill that is fluctuating when really our goal is to try to keep it as um, even as possible from year to year, absent changes in property values, of course. And for those who will be looking at um, their taxes going up, we go up, is it a half a mil on the operational mill side because we have to get to 27? We're not quite there this year, but that's outside our control. But I just want to be upfront about any other increases that people might see on their, on their tax bill. Correct. The, the general fund mill levy that supports the uh, School Finance Act uh, is going up by 0.8 and change, 8.3, something like that. Uh, mills uh, as required by state statute. Um, and then, of course, as property values have gone up, uh, the uh, property taxes, the rate is not necessarily changing on other things, uh, but the, the property tax payment is likely to go up just because of increased values. But that'll be capped after this year. We'll be at 27. We'll be at 27 mills after this coming December, yeah. Thanks. Um, then I just have a couple of quick Questions for Rob. Rob, can you remind us of the polling? Because I think we did some polling, and there's a slide on that. I know you've talked about it, but I think for people who are just now tuning in, it's just important to know that we've asked, and, and there seems to be pretty good support for this. We, and I don't remember the numbers right offhand, but we polled at three different levels. At $350 million, it polled at 60%. Uh, drops a little bit if there's other tax measures on the ballot, and we know there will be. <clears throat> but right now, that's where we stood, 60%. And then can you just talk really briefly about how we've included all schools, including the charters and the negotiations, and they'll be included in this package? Yeah, if you're looking through the critical needs list, <clears throat> you'll notice that all charters uh, were assessed the same way throughout the entire district. When we hired G Gordian come in and assess our facilities, we had them assess all of the charters in the schools. Their priorities, critical needs, uh, one and two, um, their alignment with CTE has also been included uh, within the critical needs plan. So you'll see that as you're thumbing through it. 
And I, can, I can't tell you how excited I am about the CT piece to this. I think it's long overdue in Boulder, and I'm super excited to see us trying to, to thread that needle of what's a, a building-based CT program and what's a site-based CT program. And yep. I'm really excited to start working with our community to see how we do that and to see our students have additional opportunities that will, will really help. So I'm, I'm super excited about this. So, so thank you very much. So board members, are there any other questions before we take a vote? Is there a vote, a motion, please? Lisa? <laughs>
keeping um, those that you serve in mind as we think about how we responsibly move forward with this bond measure. I'm very proud of the work that our team has done. Rob Price has done you know, just incredible work. I wouldn't have anybody in the world leading this um, rather than, than Rob and his team, Susan, um, all the folks that, that Rob um, that thanked earlier have just done an incredible job. But I also want to thank this board because I think this is a responsibility that you've taken incredibly seriously. Um, and I think that what is in this bond language represents not only what our school district needs, but it gives us the opportunity to create facilities that are going to change the lives of the kids that we're tasked to serve. Um, and so just very excited. We just wanted to publicly thank and commend the board for your work on this. Thanks. Now we will move on to our study item. I jumped the gun as I was trying to ramble to give Shannon time to talk. Um, so what we have as our only study item is the CASB resolutions. The CASB resolution, the delegate assembly is in October. I don't have the dates off the top of my head, but we do have to submit resolutions if we want 21st and it's in Denver at the Tech Center. Um, if there are any resolutions, we need to bring them forward by next board meeting. Um, the only resolution I would like to discuss with the board is a resolution around um, what happens when charter schools want to come into districts with declining enrollment? Should they be able to, what is the role of the board in, in managing that and what are the criteria that charters would have to look at in wanting to bring forward applications? Because I think um, as just not just Boulder, but Denver and Jeffco and others are, are addressing this issue. I don't think there's any clear guidance on what that looks like. And I feel like there's a tension between what school boards should be able to do in managing a budget and managing declining enrollment and still providing the kinds of opportunities for choice that we all support and are wanting to be able to continue to provide for our students, but figuring out what that right balance is and maybe that tension. So um, I don't have any language right now, but it's just something I think we might want to talk about because I think we're going to be looking at that as we go forward. So, um, Stacy, are you are you done? I don't want to cut you off. I'm wondering if there's a role for what we talked about earlier about the lunch program with a CASB resolution around that. Um, I don't know exactly what that would look like, but it might be worth talking about. And I did look up, and the ballot measure is for free lunch for all students, so it's not just K through five. So I think we could look at that because we could look at what the, um, the CDE is doing and kind of evaluating the free lunch. So certainly we could look at that between now and then. And maybe we'll have an answer to Lisa's RFI by then too. <laughs> um, any other ideas for the delegate assembly, Kitty? Yes, the things I always say. <laughs> First is I think we need to repeal the Claire Davis Act which is the act that removes um, qualified immunity from school districts if there is a, a violent incident, an incident of shooting. Um, and there is no funding for increasing any kind of um, security work or anything else. And so I'd like to see that um, repealed. And a resolution asking the legislature to please balance the budget on somebody else's back, not the backs of children getting an education. We'll have time to, if there are other issues that want to, that people want to bring up between now and then, we can certainly come up with language. If you have language, Kitty, that you'd like to propose around that, I think it would be great. Get it to, to, to us. And um, Kathleen's been through this a number of times. I think she can help us figure out how to make the language read like a resolution. So yeah, and we've had both of those in our um, as our resolutions in the past. So we can use the same language. All right, any other questions around resolutions going forward? All right, um, future agenda requests. Any? I know we're tr struggling um, to schedule our retreat. Laura gets a blue ribbon <laughs> for patience in trying to schedule that. Um, and I think we'll be able to address future agenda items when we have that retreat, when we get it scheduled, because I'm optimistic we will find a time in September to have our retreat. Um, so, Rob? Is it, is it safe to add just further investigation and conversation around the topic that was brought up where I saw a lot of head nods around free and reduced lunch and extending that 
given on our cost of living as a, as a topic on the prioritization list, not necessarily what we would speak to, but just putting that on the list as we prepare for the retreat? I don't see any no's. I see, certainly I think it's worth a conversation worth having. So yeah, I think we can add it to the list for when we have our retreat. Anything else? Do we have a motion to adjourn? Moved by Beth. All right, I think we stand adjourned. We will see you shortly. Thank you, everyone, and um, it's been a great first meeting back.